We are so honored to welcome back uh, Amy Timberlake for her first book. Is this like in eight years? I have that right. You can tell no. me. No. <laughs> I don't think oh, so. Good. There you go. This is like book selling at its finest. No, nope. <laughs> wrong. Um, Skunk and Badger, which is her um, early chapter book for, um, uh, for readers of all ages, I should say, uh, with pictures by Nun Class, and she will be uh, in conversation with another of Whitefish Bay's finest, Jim Higgins, the books and arts editor of Journal Sentinel. Amy Timberlake is uh, a Newbery honoree, and I, did, I hope I got that right that you won an Edgar Award because otherwise they're going to take away my book selling license. So with that said, I bring you Amy Timberlake and Jim Higgins. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure to meet you virtually. Uh, and before I ask you seriously difficult on the spot kind of ambush questions, could you tell us a little bit about Skunk and Badger and maybe read a little excerpt for us? Yeah, so thank you for having me. It's so fun to be here and it's so fun to actually talk to Jim Higgins. I've actually, we've, I don't think we've ever had a conversation like this. All right, so anyway, um, Skunk and Badger is the story of a badger who does important rock work and um, suddenly gets an unexpected roommate. That would be the short version. Um, and I'd say the style is kind of, well, kind of like more Wallace and Gromit meets Winnie the Pooh and then meets the odd couple. So, but let me just start by reading a little bit. And there are beautiful illustrations by John Clausen, who you may know. I mean, you really may know him. <laughs> it's really, really may know. Um, okay, chapter one. The first time Badger saw a Skunk, he thought, puny, and shut the front door. Badger didn't normally shut the door on animals that knock, but there was too much slick in this one stripe, too much puff in it. Also, there'd been that grin and the way he'd stuck out his paw as if he'd been looking forward to meeting Badger for a long, long time. Badger knew what to make of that. He shut the door before the fellow got any ideas. Not buying anything, he said through the keyhole. When the knocking continued, Badger added, ever. Then he drew the bolt and the double bolt and latched the chain. Court sight, Badger thought briskly as he added back into his rock room. Aunt Lula's brownstone row house had not come with a rock room. Badger had made improvements. He had dragged out the sofa in the cushy chairs. He'd boxed books and board games. He'd closed up the fireplace. Then he'd pushed in his rock table and his stool and lined his work light. Over the fireplace, he had hung his rock hammers and saws. His rock tumbler fit on the window seat. The bookshelves had been good place for boxes of rocks and minerals. He'd shelved them alphabetically with the most delicate specimens wrapped in tissue paper. In the fireplace, Badger had piled geodes in a pyramid to stick. Finally, Badger had shoved open the pocket doors clearing a path into the kitchen for a pawful dry cereal and declared his rock room complete. Now, Badger pulled his stool up to his rock table. He adjusted his work. He picked up a magnifying glass with one paw and the quartzite with the other. Rap, 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 rap. The sound came from the front door. Badger stopped. It was that fellow again. So that's how it starts. Um, and then, and then, and then Skunk comes in, and Skunk is exuberant, and he's really gonna knock Badger out of his little important rock room orbit. <laughs> it's gonna be pretty bad. Thanks, Amy. Um, before we get to the chickens part of this book, I want to start <laughs> at the beginning here. Uh, so when you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? It, uh, it, it, it went between being a teacher and being, being a writer. And, and were you both at one point, a teacher and a writer? 
Um, n no, not, I mean, I, I got a master's degree in English and creative writing and I taught a couple English classes, but no. So when you were a girl in Hudson, Wisconsin, growing up, what, what are the books you remember from your childhood that, that you love to read? Um, I really loved James Thurber. There was this picture book called Many Moons that I really loved. I, 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 was, I was a little, I loved, I had a Reader's Digest uh, fairy tale book that I read many times. Um, and my parents read to us a lot. So we did King, they did King Arthur, they did Journey to the Center of the Earth, <laughs> like all those kind of big epics they read. And then they would just, if, if there were parts that we weren't supposed to hear, there were always these page, pages that went very quickly. <laughs> and you'd be like, what's going on there? Uh, um, yeah, so stuff like that. So I think what you're telling me is that you were a child in 1910, maybe, uh, or, or that you, your family had very classic tastes. So. Uh, well, I, they, um, we, we definitely had like a story time before bed. And my grandfather was a story, like he would tell stories to you. So, and my father also made up stories for us. And so... Yeah, maybe, maybe. I see what I see what you're saying, but it was kind of like a traditional sort of storytelling environment that I grew up in. Yeah. Um, so with Skunk and Badger, which is not your first book, and we'll get to some of the other ones later. From what I've read, is you you set out very deliberately to write. Maybe I, you're probably too modest a person to say you set out to write a classic, but I think you set out to write a timeless book, a book that was not bound by a time period. Would you talk about your, what you wanted to do in writing Skunk and Badger? Yeah, I, well, I was working on a different project. It was going to be, you know, I was going to write something that was going to, it wasn't tied to One Came Home, but it was going to be another middle grade kind of book that I was going to write. And I was working on it and I got sort of stuck. But in researching that book, I started reading all these classic bear stories. And I mean like, you know, like bear, grr, bear. <laughs> um, and so I was reading uh, Paddington stories. I read the Winnie the Pooh stories. I read bear mythology. I read bear fairy tales. And it was when I reread the A.A. A. Milne Winnie the Pooh stories and as I said, I was kind of stuck. So I read those and I started thinking, you know, these are really beautifully crafted stories. And I started, I started wondering like, what would happen if I, if I tried to write a story that was kind of like these Winnie the Pooh stories felt like they were crafted. What would happen if I wrote a story like that? So I wasn't trying to write Winnie the Pooh. What I was trying to do was write a story with my own sense of storytelling and my own style and my own sense of humor, but in that sort of shape. <laughs> and I think the other thing that I was really thinking about was I was thinking about my parents telling us stories and reading those big, those big books to us. And, um, wanting to have a book that could be read aloud and could be shared among a lot of ages. I mean, in my field, a lot, what usually happens is your book ends up being classified for a particular age. And so it's, you know, you're writing for a seven-year-old, say, or, a, you know, or whatever. I, I actually don't do that, but but that is kind of the way the market works. And actually what I was thinking of was, I was like, if I could do one thing for kids and for family, families, I would like to create the experience of someone telling you a story or reading aloud a story and just you're together as a family experiencing the story together. So that was kind of my idea. And so when I, 
when I was writing this, I, I wanted something that could be episodic, like Winnie the Pooh has episodes. And so this would be, for me, this would be one episode, obviously much longer than a Winnie the Pooh story. <laughs> but um, it's just, you know, this is how it came out. Um, and then, uh, and then I guess I also was really thinking about if you read the story that you could read it the first time <laughs> and you would get all the all the notes so for instance if badger says something angrily i would make sure you'd know that he was angry before you said the words so you could actually read the story and read it angrily the first time so i was constantly thinking about reading aloud and i put in a bunch of sound effects I had to work really hard at trying to make them phonetic so that you could sell, you could say them as you would if you were like a really good storyteller. <laughs> so, so it's stuff like that that I was really thinking about. And when I wrote it, I, I wasn't sure that there was a market for what I was doing. So I just did it and I said, this is really what I would like to create. I'm not sure this is going to be marketable. And so actually what I ended up doing was I ended up writing two chapters, giving them to my agent and then seeing if he liked them and saying, you know, tell me no. So. Now you were reading a lot of books about bears. So how did you get <laughs> specifically to a skunk and a bear? I'm assuming badger because you're from Wisconsin, although you're forced to live uh, uh, across the enemy line there in Illinois. But how did you get to a skunk and a badger? I, you know, that is really hard to tell. I, I mean, I, I, I mean, it could be as simple as Wisconsin badgers. I mean, it really could be. I mean, but I think, I think it was, I think there's a couple of things. They're black and white. I like black and white animals. I like, I, I weirdly like stripes. I would say this just shows up in my life. Things in my apartment are striped. I don't understand this. <laughs> so, I mean, it's stuff like that. And there was a story like way before I, before even one came home where I had a skunk detective. And at another point, like closer to this time period, I had a story where I was trying to write a badger who was had an important stamp collection <laughs> which I'm really glad that this is rocks so <laughs> what the route it, it, we saw a uh, image by the wonderful artwork by John class and I just want to bring it back up for a second here where did they come to you as one big guy and one little guy or is that a did that happen in the course of the artwork Oh, no, I think the size, the size, I mean, John is really good at that, um, at putting different animals together with different sizes. So that's, it's, it's John's ability in some way, but it is in the text too, yeah. that badger is bigger because I, I, every animal in here, I have to look up like how many inches they are and like, are they a third of the size of the other animal? And I mean, so you're kind of, yeah, so I pretty much know how big all the chickens are. I know how big all the, the skunk is. I, you know, yeah. Um, <laughs> would you say, say we were getting on the elevator with you and you were going to briefly introduce skunk and badger. So what's your elevator pitch on who they are as people, their characters? Well, I... I, I think you could say Badger is an important rock science scientist who does important rock work and every day he goes into his rock room and focus, focus, focus. And Skunk is enthusiastic, uh, an animal, an animal animal. So instead of a people person, it would be <laughs> an animal animal. I don't know. Um, you know, he just, he, he loves other, he loves other animals. He's very interested in them. And I mean, they're very different. They're very, very different. I mean, Badger would just never know he was, he was there and Skunk would know everybody in his town in five seconds. 
And I'm not very good at the elevator pitch, as you might have just figured out. <laughs> it's too long. It's too long. <laughs> that, that's okay. Uh, uh, now, I doubt you would give me a true answer as to whether you were a skunk or a badger, but how about this? What percentage of each are you? What oh. percentage are skunk and what percentage badger? I am both. And this 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 book is like you're seeing you're seeing the struggle of my soul. <laughs> it's like <laughs> I have one part of me that is just wants to go out and be outside and want to, you know, and have a have a fun time. And the other part that's like, no, now is the time. You must focus, focus, focus. So it's totally, I'm totally both. Um, yeah. And I mean, as far as, you know, Badger, yeah, I, I, I totally identify with both of them. <laughs> so are you a good cook like Skunk is? Well, I will say that I do think that a big part of the success of my marriage is, is due to the fact that I cook. <laughs> So, <laughs> does, that, does that mean that I, Phil does the dishes? Like, is that how it works? Just like what Skunk and Oh, Bear? yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I, I mean, actually, but it, uh, the funny, the funny part about that is that, um, <laughs> is that one time he tried to, he tried to surprise me by cooking a meal. And I came home and I was not in the mood for having this meal. And he like worked so hard. So after that, I, so he, I gave him this look and it was really sad because I was like, oh, I'm not really excited about that. So then after that, he had to, he just said, I'm always doing the dishes. You get to choose what we eat. And he's like, he's like a super enthusiastic eater. And honestly, I love cooking for people who love to eat, and he loves to eat. So Badger loves to eat, and I would love to cook for Badger. <laughs> yes. Um, now, we have these two folks, but we also have a whole lot of chickens. Where did the chickens come from, and mm. did you invent any of those breed names in that book? No. They're real breeds. And in fact, tonight when you go home, Google Transylvania naked neck chicken and see what comes up in the images. Because the British breed book that I have actually, that was the funniest chicken book. So that, but it's a British breed book that I have. She said, if you raise Transylvania naked necks, um, all your neighbors are going to think you're abusing your chickens because they look unhealthy, but they totally are that. Okay, so the chickens, this is what happened. When I was writing chapter one, and this is such a funny thing, Skunk comes in, Skunk comes in, and he has this red suitcase. And as the writer, I knew that at some point Skunk was going to open the suitcase and we were going to find out what was in the suitcase. And there's this rule of three that you, you use when you're a writer. It's funnier and it's, you know, it's just a pattern that is in all sorts of, all sorts of other writing. So you use the rule of three. So I knew there were going to be three things in Skunk's red suitcase. So the suitcase opens and I write pajamas like what's what's he gonna have he's gonna have a pair of pajamas he's gonna have a storybook that seemed obvious okay those two things and then out of my head pops chicken whistle I have no idea what a chicken whistle is I'm like a chicken whistle I I don't know what this means all I know is if you say that there's a whistle a whistle will be blown at some point <laughs> and if you say that there's chicken a chicken whistle, well, surely there's going to be a chicken. So as soon as that happened, then as I was doing the drafts, you know, I knew that in chapter one, a chicken appears. <laughs> and then I knew that the chicken whistle was going to be blown. And then at some point, other chicken things were going to happen. That's all I knew. So are you looking for that image? 
no, no, no. Uh, I, I'm just thinking right now that somewhere uh, Chekhov's estate is getting residuals because you brought up that <laughs> classic, uh, classic rule. Um, so here's the, I don't know if you can see that, but there's a lot of chickens in this image of John's. <laughs> yes, there are. Uh, and there's a giant chicken. That's that was my favorite, the giant. I, I forget the. Oh, breed. the Jersey Jersey Giant. Yes, the Jersey Giant. So, um, now this is a this is a fun book. Uh, this is a flowing read, but I can also tell that you are kind of a badger when it comes to research for your books and uh, learning mm. important facts and sharing them. So. I learned more about rocks in this book than anything I've ever read. And, I, and as I'll tell folks, when Amy and I traded messages, I said, I also do important rock work, but mine is with albums and CDs. And, uh, but you, 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 are do, you tell us so much about rocks. Uh, were you a rock person before this? Or did you learn all that stuff for this book? I am still learning geology, and if any of you are geologists, um, be gentle with me. I'm still in the midst of learning. It's really, it's actually really, it's hard work. I and I, because it's science, and I have so much respect for them. All right, so um, the the truth about the rocks is that my family. Um, my grandfather was in the copper industry, and so when I visited them in the summer, he, he was in Arizona, and his yard was decorated with old mining equipment and huge chunks of rocks. So I feel like rocks are just kind of in the family. My dad had a rock collection of some sort. He had the geode bookends. He had all this stuff. I would have said that I was not interested in any of the rock stuff. Um, but when, that's another funny thing. I, I, I knew that Badger needed something very important to do. And this was after the stamp collecting, apparently, the next thing that popped out of my head was rocks. And so I suddenly was put in the position of having to start to really learn about rocks. So yeah, I, I'm still working on it. And I, I would, in, in book two, I get into geological time. <laughs> I, have to, I have to tell you, it is mind bending to think that long and it is not completely natural to me so it was and and one of the things that you're trying to do when you're when you know you're writing for kids is to be really clear so you're just you just keep going over the same fact and you go how many how many ways can i say this that makes it super clear as what this is and still makes it fun so I believe I write a really bad ukulele song about geological time in book two. <laughs> it's a really bad song. So if you try to play it, it's, it's not good. I, I sure hope there's going to be a, uh, a, a CD <laughs> with book two, you know, so we can hear you sing these ukulele oh, um, I know somebody will probably, somebody will ask me if, if yeah, somebody will ask me and I'm going to have to do it and it's going to be, I'm, I'm really uncomfortable with singing, too. <laughs> so, so what, what about you? Do, you? do you sing, Jim? Uh, only when no one else is around, believe me. <laughs> um, all right. So your bio doesn't mention if you have any children. No, no children. So I, I thought that, and I'm wondering, uh, how do you keep your connection... It, it, you've already kind of made it clear, you write what you think works uh, rather than micro-targeting audience. But I wonder, how do you keep your connection to readers that age or that mindset? I, I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I enjoy the, I enjoy this kind of storytelling and I just go for it and I throw myself in. And I, I, I hope I'm doing it okay. So you're kind of telling me that there's still a very strong middle grade reader inside you. 
Yeah, I mean, I I have I have kept in touch with it. And I mean, my dad, my dad was a very playful man. I mean, I think I think when we had family gatherings, his favorite people were the people under three feet tall. So it was like anybody small would just gather to my dad. And so I often think of him a lot. I think of him and his playful sense and how, you know, he, he never lost um, you know, he would still laugh. You remember those cups, and Di those Dixie cup jokes? I don't know if anybody remembers this, but they were really bad jokes. And my dad would find those hilarious. And so, you know, I just, I, I kind of still find like all those jokes funny. Yeah. <laughs> you, the way you describe your father makes him sound like skunk telling stories to all the chickens, except they're not all under uh, Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he definitely. Uh, how did you come to, to decide or realize that you, the people you wanted to write for were kids and not adults? Hmm. Um, I, think, I think it was partly opportunity and partly, I, I really, it was, um, I finished writing my master's degree thesis. It was a novella written for adults. And um, it, was, uh, it was about um, 18th century counterfeiters in Massachusetts. And I, I finished this novella. And it was really hard. And but I finished it, I got my degree. And I remember what I remember was that at that point, I just wanted to do something fun. And I remembered this story that my grandfather had told me called, and he called it The Dirty Cowboy, which ended up being my first book, which was this story of this, um, this guy who took his dog down the river to, he was, he worked, he worked um, in, in Mexico with cattle and he didn't clean very often. And so he went for his yearly bath, took his dog down to the, to the river and when cleaned up, his dog didn't recognize him and wouldn't let him have his clothes. And so he had to walk home bare naked. So I remember this, this funny story of, of this man who had supposedly, and this supposedly happened, my great grandfather supposedly reported this in the newspaper, that this guy ended up walking home bare naked because his dog wouldn't let him have his clothes after he had this bath. So I thought, you know, I just want to tell that story. That was the funnest story I ever I ever, you know, so I, I want to write it up. So I wrote it up and um, I had worked as a children's bookseller for, um, before, before I'd written the story. And so I knew that there might be, I just thought that would be a good story for kids. I really never thought about the fact that the guy loses his clothes on page two and then is naked for the rest of the book. And I thought, and we, later people said, you know, you can't publish this kind of book. He has no clothes, 30 pages. It's an illustrated book. I didn't think about this. So anyway, so I wrote it and um, ended up getting it, getting, uh, getting a publisher for that. And then once that door was opened, I, I just thought, you know, this isn't a bad place to be. I mean, if you're writing for children, you have, you don't have to, you can write across genre, you can, you can write all sorts of different things. You can write science fiction, you can, you know, and kids, there are certain things that kids, you know, are very open to that you can do. So I just thought, why not? why not walk through this door? I have this opportunity to do this. So I did it. Yeah. So that was it. So with this book, you you worked with one of the great illustrators of children's books of our time. And, yeah. I, and I, know the, I know other people match you too, but how did you feel about uh, collaborating with John on the book? Oh my gosh, this is fun. I... Um, we, we were paired, so the way this worked was my agent paired John and I together. 
So, and then sold us as a pair. So that's how this happened. And this isn't the normal way it happens. As I, you know, usually what happens is the editor finds the illustrator for you, but the, my agent paired the two of us together because we have the same agent. Um, and I, you know, I thought it would be fabulous to work with John. And, um, and when he said yes, I was really excited. And he actually, this was, this was the way that he wanted to do the book, which was, you know, um, in this sort of classic style with the, you know, there's like a front, I think it's a frontispiece, I don't know, um, this beautiful color illustration. And then a tip-in art, so way in the back, there's this gorgeous, um, John said, you know, this is what I want to do. I want to do something like this. And how do you feel about that? And I said, well, that sounds great to me because where is my, oh, there it is. All right. Um, so this is the big color spread. You know, I mean, it's just such a beautiful book that John and Algonquin together. Um, so, yeah, it, I actually, but once we were in the process, once Algonquin had purchased it, I, I had very little contact with John. And it was only until, only until the book was almost finished did we, did we start talking. Um, but I did see early, I mean, when John finished this, Elise Howard, my editor, sent this um, on email and this is amazing. I mean, I just thought, wow. I actually thought this is a funny, the funny thing is, is it was so what I had imagined that I actually felt like it was like a photograph of Badger in his rock room. And it was almost, it was a little creepy as if John had gone into my head, taken a photograph and then put it in the book. Like, of course, this is a John Clausen thing, but everything was that was Badger and that was his intensity. And that was, so yeah, I think John nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> and he's great. You have enough pictures in this book that I think someone could read it to a child who can't follow all the words yet, but there's enough pictures to keep somebody going through the story, so. Oh, good, I'm glad. Yeah, I think, I think so too. And I, I put a lot of um, sound effects. I mean, there's a lot of fun sound effects in here. Yeah. And I promise that if you just go for it, I think it'll sound pretty good. So. <laughs> this is a good point to remind people that in Daniel has put in the chat box uh, a link to purchase Skunk and Badger from Boswell. Uh, if, if you want to get it from the source and not from some nasty Illinois bookstore. Um, so you, you are planning two more Skunk and Badger books, Amy? It's, I'm under contract for two more. Uh, so it's like Star Wars, you might be nine or 15 or 32, depending on how things go. Well, I mean, I do have ideas. I do have ideas for these. So, and I, I mean, it's funny. I haven't had characters that I've wanted to just keep writing about, but I love these characters. I really feel strongly about them, so. Uh, Daniel, I have time to talk about Amy's earlier book, don't I? You're not on there to kick us off, are you? Okay, well, well before we get to that, I wanna ask this, uh, you gotta ask every writer this question. Who would play Skunk and Badger in the movie Skunk and Badger? Oh, well, I mean, Skunk is the harder one. I think um, I think Samuel Jackson would be really good for Badger. I mean, I think if you just imagine Samuel Jackson with the first line, you kind of go, oh my gosh, I'd be so like. So I think that would be good. Oh, did you lose me? We, we lost you briefly, Amy, but you're back now. Okay, so Samuel Jackson and then Skunk. I don't know. I'm gonna have to think about that. I I, I don't know. I mean, he's he's so he's so earnest. <laughs> I'm well, gonna I, need. <laughs> I, I have a suggestion for you, but we'd have to go back to the time machine a little to get him. And I I was okay. thinking, uh, 
Raul Julia, maybe about the age he was in the Adams Family movie. I bet he could be ah. a star. All right. Okay. Okay. Maybe that our readers, uh, maybe our readers have some. Um, all right. The reason we know each other a little is because I read about your previous novel, One Came Home, which is there are some things in common, but it's a very different book. And before I ask you about that a little bit, uh, I wanted you to tell us, just readers who haven't heard it, what is One Came Home about? Um, One Came Home is a Western set in Wisconsin. It takes place in 1871, and it's about a girl. It starts at a it starts at a funeral, for uh, and it starts at a funeral and it's the girl's sister that's being buried and she decides she decides that her sister isn't dead even though it seems to everyone else that they're burying their sister she decides her sister isn't dead and she goes and she goes off to find her and it is set during um one of the interesting things that i found was that in 1871 there was this enormous passenger pigeon nesting that happened in Wisconsin. It's just huge amount of birds. I mean, it, I, I, it's been a while since I've talked about One Came Home, so I'm forgetting all my facts. But I mean, you are talking about birds the size of crows that would fly over in big, my, big, big flocks that would block out the sun for days. I mean, it's like, it's the craziest thing you can ever imagine, and yet it is completely natural. <laughs> so I use that as the setting in this book, too, as part of the thing. And you had a really remarkable protagonist, uh, Georgina, or Georgie, in that book, who, yeah. who, who had a very special uh, Wild West ability. Oh, yeah, she, she shot um, a Spencer... Spencer rifle. <laughs> and she never missed it was her talent. Yeah, she was good. She was good. <laughs> um, where did One Came Home come from? What was the impulse that led you to write that book? Um, I, I think it was partly, I, I was a history major in college and uh, my, I think I, I think I just, um, I think I just mentioned that my master's thesis was actually, was actually historical fiction because I, I used um, 18th century counterfeiters in it. But the novel that I actually wrote right before one came home was um, a realism, well, 1980s. So no technology. So now it seems like historical fiction, but it was a 1980s Wisconsin piece um, called That Girl Lucy Moon. And I wrote that book to just try to get my head around what a novel was in terms of shape in my head. And so when I finished that, everything that I didn't get to do in that book, I wanted to do in the next book. And I hadn't done any history and I was a history major, so I really wanted some history. And um, I, I had, I had seen, um, I had seen. Uh, oh, I'm forgetting. Anyway, I there were a bunch of different things, but it was. I think it was partly. It was really that. And also, I wanted to write a mystery, so I was like, I want a western. I want a western. I want to write a mystery, and I want some. I want to see if I can do his, historical fiction well. So I, I, I had all these little challenges that I was setting for myself. So, and then this one was again, another challenge, which was what would it be like if you tried to write something like A.A. A. Milne in that shape? And that's what happened this time. <laughs> um, and I'll keep tooting the horn on one came home a little bit because it has, if you were looking for female protagonists that chart their own path, Georgie charts her own path. She's her own boss. She's, and I've described it as true grit for kids. She's on a yeah, quest and she definitely. runs the show. Both of, the, both of those books are really closely involved in the natural world, in small towns. Is that 
a setting that really appeals to you? Do you feel at home in, in the natural world and in a rural environment? Um, well, I grew, the town that I grew up in, Hudson, when I was there, it was a town of 10,000. And um, felt, it felt like everybody knew everybody's business. And I, that's how I, that's, I, 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 in a way, I, I, I wanted to, in some ways, I wanted to escape it. But the further, I, you know, when I went off to college, I started to realize what a special place that was. And th that I actually had had a very special, you know, just being in a world where people knew you and you knew the people that ran the newspaper and you knew all these uh, I, I, I love that. And I actually still miss that now. Um, so I do feel like I'm writing, I'm writing to remember it myself and to, you know, I mean, in this, in this book, there's North Twist and there's a town and I think it is, it is related to my experience of living in Hudson. Yeah. I mean, there was like a gossip columnist and you had to be, you had to be aware of what you did because this woman would write about you in the newspaper. I mean, my gosh, I mean, it's enough to be a teenager, but then to have like this woman. Anyway, all right, so there you go. <laughs> wow. Um, you know that North Twist is a perfectly believable Wisconsin town name. We have North Freedom, you know, we're, oh. it, it's a totally believable Wisconsin town name. Uh, I want to ask you about something serious. Uh, in your publisher's weekly interview for Skunk and Badger, you mentioned you were thinking about the Syrian refugees while you're at Could you, would you connect that, dots on that? Uh, what was, what were you thinking about? And did any of that thinking show up in your book? Yeah. Um, okay. I started, I started, I started writing this uh, before, uh, before the election, so um, the last election. <laughs> and uh, I was reading, at the time, all the news of the Syrian refugee crisis was coming through the news. So I was writing this while I was reading all these stories about people and borders and people coming, you know, stories of survivors and where people were going. So I was actually sort of I was just reading that. I wasn't thinking that they were going to come together, but the the truth is when you work on something, the 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 things that you're thinking about work their way into the stories. And so this is what happened in chapter like I do a lot of drafts. So you know, I don't know what draft this happened in, but there's a part in chapter one where Skunk comes into the house and he's got this red, red suitcase and it becomes clear that he's about to move in. And Badger says, um, let me see, I'll just get to it. So um, Badger says, don't you have your own, don't you have your own home? Um, so, so, and so Badger blurts, you know, don't you have your own home? And Skunk flinched and took a step back. Well, Badger heard himself say, Skunk looked at Badger and rubbed a paw through his stripe. I did have a home, he said. Badger raised an eyebrow. Skunk looked away, fiddled with his tail, then deflated, and he met Badger's eyes and he whispered, not everyone wants a skunk. And as soon as he finished those words, Badger jerked up, oh, sk Skunk jerks upright. And with a hop, he snatches his red suitcase off the floor and he says, oh, I'm so, so sorry. This is so, so embarrassing. You know, I'll just leave. I know you weren't expecting me, you know, whatever. And that actually came about because, because I was reading that stuff. And so I wrote that line and I thought, I just thought, oh, oh, this has just gotten really serious. Now I'm going to have to carry this all the way through. But the way that I do my drafts is I just keep writing, I'm writing, and I just, I just kept it there. 
I just was like, well, it was kind of like the red suitcase, you know, with the chicken whistle, but much more serious. And I just thought, well, this is really serious now because now Skunk is basically homeless and Badger isn't asking for all the backstory, but there's obviously something serious that has happened here. And I'm going to have to carry this all the way to the end. And if this doesn't get resolved in a way that feels okay to me, then I'm just going to have to call this story trash <laughs> and move on. Yeah, because that's the way, it, you know, I just feel like if I don't like really believe that what happens, how this is, how this arc is completed, I'm going to just, I'm going to just stop and we're not going to do it because, I mean, I, I believe in the, in kids and I know that they'll see through me if I don't do the hard work of carrying that arc all the way to the end. So I just kept it in the story and I just kept doing drafts and then eventually little pieces would fall in place and I'd be like, okay, that's okay. I can keep, you know, we'll just, you know, it's, it's still working. I, I, you know, I think I still believe in the story. <laughs> so, yeah, so it was really serious. It was really serious. And I, I felt like it, it was right. And I, it just felt right. And I was like, all right, it, I, then I have to carry through. Wow, uh, this is a, you've given me a good opening to ask this question. I'm sure we have some writers on to, uh, watching this. And uh, what's, your, what's your advice to wannabe writers, young writers, people starting to work it out? Now that, now that you're a writer reviewed, not only in our local rag, but in the New York Times, where they talk about how great you are, uh, congratulations. What's your advice? Uh, what's your advice for writers here? So. Um, hmm. I I would just say I mean I would say enjoy it. Just try to I mean and let I mean look they, it's it's hard work. It's really it's really hard work, but it's also a joy. And so if you're young and you're telling if you're if you're just starting out, I'd say. You know, try not to judge yourself too much. Try not to cut yourself, you know, say, oh, I can't do this. I can't do that. Don't put too many rules in there. Just let your imagination go. If you want to get shot out of a vacuum cleaner, sucked up into an alien airship, you know, riding a horse. I mean, if that's your story, you know, just try it. See what happens. Just play and see where you go. And then... And then, you know, if you've been doing this for a while, then I'd say, well, I mean, the craft stuff is real. It's really good to have good skills and to just learn, you know, as much as you can about, you know, the rule of three and humor and, you know, just all of that, you know, take the time to learn all that. And, you know, every hour in your chair counts. It really does, it really does add up to something. It's not an efficient thing, writing, but it is like, it is, it is, it is joyful. And when you create something that you feel like you did the best you could do, it's a good feeling. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and to help people understand how much work it is, how many drafts would you guess you wrote and how, how much time oh. elapsed from the idea to you turned into manuscript? Oh, I try not to think about this so much. It's so painful, Jim. Because, I mean, <laughs> okay. But, I mean, kids always ask this, so it's a fair question. You got to answer the kids. All right. So, well, you do now know that I started working this project sometime before the last election. So the entire time that, that we've been in this, in President Trump in the time of President Trump, I, I've been working on this project in some ways. I mean, I guess there have been a couple of times. So three years, I guess. And then I really, I mean, this book in particular, I know it is so skinny. Like it is so skinny. And here's the thing. It's all about cutting. This book was all about cutting. So it was all like you write 20 pages, you get 
one little chunk that's like this big, you pull it out and you go, boom, and then you keep working because I mean, I, I don't write this stuff like just from beginning to end. It's all like pull out, smooth over. Oh my gosh. So I, you know, in a way I kind of wish it were like, you know, like several books, like it looked heavier, but it, you know, it's, this was all, this, this story was almost like writing a play for me. It's all dialogue and timing and, you know, so you're just like, oh, that's heavy. That's too much. You know, toss that character out the window. This, that's, that's what I did. <laughs> it's you know, painful. <laughs> you know, Amy, uh, Steely Dan would record the solos over and over and over and over again until they got it just right. So, uh, Maybe, okay. maybe you're like them, you know, you're, uh, Yay! <laughs> uh, all right, does it help to have a playwright in the house when you're a writer? Isn't oh. there a playwright? Yeah, well, he's an actor. He's even better. Yeah, he's an actor. Yes, it does. It does in the fact that, okay, the funny thing is, is his ideas always get illustrated. So I think that tells you a lot. In my first picture book, there was this moment where he says to me, he says to me, oh, that's a Scooby-Doo moment. And he makes a Scooby-Doo sound. So I'm like, okay, I got to put my Scooby-Doo moment in the book. Guess what? Adam Rex illustrates his Scooby-Doo moment. In this, in this one, I was having trouble with the scene. And he said, oh, this is the scene where you, you say, where you're like, no, and I think you know which scene that was. And guess what? Guess what John Clausen illustrates? No. <laughs> so yeah, no, totally helpful to have someone to talk to. And I mean, and sometimes when I don't quite get the joke right, he's like the guy. He knows the timing. He's like, it goes like this. He'll just say, goes, dun, 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 you know, whatever. And I'll go, oh, thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, credit where credit is due. Phil. Phil. And as you'll see on the front page, it says for Phil. So, you know, he gets his dedication too. What you're telling me is that Phil really should be a director since he knows how to set up a scene here. So, uh, yeah, well, well, he doesn't like to direct, he says. <laughs> uh, um, thank you so much for taking time here with me and with us. And are there any parting words you have for people who are going to race to their web browsers to go buy a copy of your book? Oh, I think you're going to have a nice time. Just, just have a nice time. And even if you don't, if you don't have kids or you don't, whatever, I think you can get like a mug of something hot or whatever and you can just read this book and it'll just be you'll feel like you'll you'll be in this other world i think you'll feel good <laughs> that's what i think we need this right now we need like kind of like nice time so i think it'll be a fun time i think you'll like it and john has done a beautiful job like it's just a gorgeous book it's a real book thank you oh and amy is there a tentative publication date for book two uh, next fall. Next fall. Great. Thank yeah. You. Next fall. Well, thank you for having me. Right. Daniel, uh, the ball is back in your court here. So Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much, Amy. We're so looking forward, not just for book two, but just selling, bringing a big smile to everyone who's going to buy book one. Jim, thank you so much for all the work you do and for actually suggesting that we contact Amy to put an event together. Yeah, so, thank you. Uh, you know, we're one big something or other. And um, <laughs> and thanks all of you for coming. For coming, we wouldn't have a bookstore without you. I hope to see you another event. If you're um, not local, you can buy the book. What at your favorite independent bookstore? Uh, we do have. Uh, we did have some of the book plates that you, that Amy and John Clausen uh, signed together. Uh, there's a rumor that we might be getting some more. So if you put in an order and you like that, uh, let us know, and we'll hold your copy instead of sending it out right away. So thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful evening, and uh, happy reading to everybody. Thank you. Thanks.